So one quick correction, it's Patrice, not Trish. So it's just my bad hearing, and I apologize. <laughs> so we'll get that updated for you guys, but don't everyone go up and talk to Trish. She's not here. <laughs> so today we're going to be looking in Luke 17. Um, we're going through a series on what the church is. And right now we're looking at last week, what is the gospel? What's the good news that the church has? And today, what is compassion? And if you're a Bible flipper, we're going to be actually be looking through a big chunk of the Bible in Luke, not just Luke 17. So if you have an app or a Bible, keep that open. If not, I'll try to keep you up. But talking about service can be hard. Um, we don't want to serve others. If you know Bob Dylan at all, um, not a great singer, but a very good songwriter. And he became a Christian. He wrote the song called You've Got to Serve Somebody. And then he's saying, you might be the ambassador to England or to France, but you're going to serve somebody. It might be the devil. It might be the Lord. You're going to serve somebody. And John Lennon hated that song. And so he wrote a song called Serve Yourself. And the first words, I listened to it this morning, where he's just like, I heard you found Jesus. And just like right at Dylan. And pretty much says, you have to serve yourself. If you don't serve yourself, nobody else will. And you could argue, going back to Dylan's, that if you're going to serve between Jesus or the Lord and the devil, John Lennon picked the devil and himself. You could argue that when we serve ourselves, we rarely turn into people of generosity. So I want to read to you one of the harder passages that Jesus says in Luke 17 and talk about how we can build a heart of compassion so that we actually do want to serve others. So this is what Jesus says in Luke 17, starting in verse 7. He says, suppose one of you has a servant plowing and looking after the sheep. Will he say to the servant when he comes from the field, come now, sit and down and eat? Won't he rather say, prepare my supper, get yourself ready and wait for me while I eat and drink? And after that, you may eat and drink. Will he then thank the servant because he did what he was told to do? So you also, when you've done everything you were told to do, should say, we are unworthy servants. We have only done our duty. So let's pray that God can help us to understand. Heavenly Father, I want to be a servant. Sometimes it's so hard. So I pray that your Holy Spirit would be here today, that you would take my words, take your word, and change us, Lord. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So have you ever read a book that you didn't know was a part of a larger world? And then when you saw the bigger world around it, you realized that there was so much more texture to it. As a kid, I read The Hobbit um, in our church library. My dad was a deacon. My mom just was in choir and a lot of things. So I spent a lot of time just at church, bored, like all kids do. And I would sit on the bottom shelf, and the church library had all these books that none of them were interesting to me, stuff by this guy named Calvin and Luther, stuff I now like. On the bottom shelf, there was two box sets, The Chronicles of Narnia and The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings. And so that's where I spent all my time. I remember reading The Hobbit, and there was a little cartoon that Baskin Rass made, and you see all this great stuff. And then you read The Lord of the Rings, and you see that that's just a little fragment of a much bigger world. And then you read, if you're a real geek, you read The Silmarillion, you realize that even The Lord of the Rings is a little sliver of a bit much bigger world. And Tolkien created this giant universe. And the reason I bring that up is a lot of us take lines from the Bible, like this little parable here, and we want to think of it only on its own. And sometimes that's helpful, but sometimes it's okay and necessary to step back and say, what's the story that's being told here? Not just what's this little saying, but what's the bigger fabric? And so that's what I want to do this morning is we're going to look back at this whole section in Luke. And this is at the very tail end of it. And I think it's going to show us three things that can help us build compassion. Because the adventure we're on is not there and back again like in The Hobbit. It's there to the kingdom of God, where we're going to be people of compassion the way Jesus is. And so these are the three things I'm hoping we'll see today, is that Christ's church is called to embody compassion, that our resources are given to us for that mission, and our attitudes in the mission must be that of a servant. So let's look at what compassion means. Compassion is something that Jesus embodied his entire ministry. His whole life, and if we're going to be his church, we're called to do the same thing, is to be compassionate. This section starts in Luke 13. You don't have to turn there. But it says in Luke 13, 22, that Jesus went through the towns and villages of Jerusalem, teaching as he went. And so he's on his way through the villages and countryside, 
to where he would ultimately be crucified. This is his last journey. And so he's beginning to teach people what's it like for the kingdom of God to come. In one part, Luke says that Jesus' face is set like flint, that he knows what's coming in Jerusalem, but he's resolved to die because that's how he's going to serve. And then there's a little smaller section within this. In Luke 15, it says, the tax collectors and sinners were all gathered around to hear Jesus. But the Pharisees of the law, or then the teachers of the law muttered and complained, this man welcomes sinners and eats with them. And so as Jesus gets closer to Jerusalem, you see two groups beginning to develop. On one hand, there's sinners and tax collectors. On the other hand, there's you know, people like me, religious people, teachers of the law. And they're muttering. The, the Greek word there means it's a thunderous. It's not like a small, like, psh, psh, psh. it's like you're talking to your wife and your microphone's on that loud of a, <laughs> of a muttering where everybody can hear. And so what they're doing is showing their contempt for Jesus's actions. Because what they were afraid of was guilt by association. If I hang out with a tax collector, his evil might rub off on me. And you might think I actually like him and endorse him. So I'm going to stay away. And this is what religion has been known for for years. And what's interesting right now in our world, I see the church is getting better at welcoming sinners. And the, the outside the church is getting worse. Where they'll look through every old tweet, every old article. You know, where there's an office star who was in a beauty pageant and found out that the owner of the beauty pageant had some racist background. And so now she's canceled. And so we tend to become a group that right now tries to push people away is what the world around us does, what the Pharisees did. Sometimes in the church we do that. But what we see in Jesus is he's always stepping toward them. And if you look at the flow of how Jesus taught, and I, we very rarely do this, we look at all the stuff, and all these could be sermons or series of sermons. This is what he's been talking about from Luke 15 to where we come in. The very beginning, after the Pharisees and the teachers of the law start grumbling about him, he says, let me tell you a story, a couple stories actually, about a lost sheep and a lost coin and a lost son. And so he begins to tell them that the lost things matter, that the shepherd would leave the 99 and go after the one lost one. And then he goes into a very odd story called the parable of the shrewd manager, and we'll deal, dig into it, but it's pretty much a story about a guy who embezzles and cooks the books, and at the end, he's commended for it tricky one. Then after that, he talks about how the kingdom of God is advancing. Then he has a one-verse, throwaway seeming reference about marriage and divorce. Then he talks about the parable of the rich man and Lazarus. There was the rich man who doesn't get a name. Lazarus was the beggar that even the dogs would lick his wounds, and the rich man gave him nothing. And then from there, he goes into part of what we just read, where he talks about faith and being a servant. And so I spent some time really contemplating this whole section and wondering, what's Jesus really talking about here? And right in the middle, he talks about the kingdom of God is advancing. This is what Jesus says. He says, the law and the prophets have been proclaimed all the way until John, meaning John the Baptist. People now call him John the Baptizer because they think he's a member of the Southern Baptist denomination. But I can't call him John the Baptizer. It sounds weird. It just meant that he baptized people. John. Since that time, the good news of the kingdom of God is being preached, and everyone is forcing their way into it. It's easier for heaven and earth to disappear than for the least stroke of the pen to drop out of the law. And so I think that's in kind of the center of this area, because what Jesus is saying, surrounded by sinners, he's looking at the Pharisees, the tax collector, or the Pharisees, the teachers of the law, the religious people, saying, you guys have been praying for the kingdom of God. You've been studying the law and the prophets. And what you're seeing right now is the fulfillment of it. That from the beginning of Genesis all the way through Malachi, the Old Testament was pointing to a God, a kingdom, that would welcome people from every tribe, every nation, that would love the unlovable, that would have compassion upon those who don't deserve compassion. That's been the story from the beginning. You call yourself children of Abraham. Look at Abraham. Did he deserve grace? He cheated on his wife. He sold his own wife into marriage with another guy because he was scared. Not the best role model, but he's someone who received grace. Look at Jacob. You call yourselves Israel. The guy whose name was changed to Israel was closer to Loki of anything. He was a trickster. Jacob means trickster. He doesn't deserve grace, but God gave it to him, gave it out of compassion. 
And it would be easier, I mean, it's impossible to take away any stroke, jot, or tittle, he's saying, in one part of the law. Because the law, the prophets, point to a God, a kingdom, that would welcome sinners. People like us. People like everybody but Jesus. And I think that's the main passion, the main message is that the kingdom of God is advancing, and this is how it advances, by Jesus teaching the truth. He never waters it down. He never sits down with the tax collectors and sinners and says, you guys are awesome just the way you are. Keep collecting those taxes. Keep sleeping around. You guys are great. That is never what he said. He called them to repentance and to change. And listening to him, they wanted to. So by teaching the truth and showing compassion, the kingdom of God was advancing so much that these people were forcing their ways into it. They're saying, I got to get into what God's doing. I want to be a part of God's grace. And you stand that against the teachers of the law, the Pharisees, and what they try to do is to keep non, non-religious people at arm's length. They would go through all these hoops to try to argue who a neighbor really was because it comes down to love God and love your neighbor. And if you've ever read the story of the Good Samaritan, one of the teachers of the law says, well, who's my neighbor? And that's the sort of trick that they would always play because if you're religious, you know how to play mind games with the Bible so that you can talk about the Bible without actually doing the stuff the Bible says. So one of the debates back then was if a Gentile falls out of a boat and is drowning, are you obligated to help him? And the best teachers of the law, and this is from Ben Syriac, said, you you may help him, but you're not obligated. Here's a few other things. Does that sound... Gospel, doesn't that sound like the Bible? Yeah, you ain't got it because he's a Gentile. He's a different race. You don't want to deal with that. If you touch him, you'll be unclean, so I save him. It says in um, Ben Sirach, chapter 12, verse 4, Give to the merciful, but do not uphold the sinner. God will repay vengeance to the ungodly and to sinners and keep them against the day of vengeance. Give to the good, but don't receive a sinner. Do good to the humble. Do not give them to the ungodly. Hold back your bread from them, meaning the ungodly. Give it not to him, lest thereby he overmaster you. If you feed a sinner, he might get strong and then conquer you. So starve him. One of the best teachers in Israel writing this. For thou shalt receive twice as much evil for all the good you do to him, meaning a a sinner. For the highest also hates sinners, and repay vengeance upon the ungodly. So in the context of this sort of writing, Jesus is welcoming sinners. And saying the kingdom of God is advancing and these people that you're calling sinners are forcing their way into it and you're not. And here's the thing that I often miss is when Jesus says these things, he's not like putting his thumb in the Pharisee's eye and trying to rub their nose and like, you guys are awful. He loves them. The stuff he says to the Pharisees and to the sinners and the tax collectors to all of them is to get them to find life and truth. So when he talks about the story of the Good Samaritan, when he talks about the story of the lost son, the lost coin, the lost sheep, he's not just saying, you guys are wrong and I'm right. He's saying, join me. I love you guys. Could you get in here? Because Bible scholars, and this is true of pastors, long-term church members, people who lead Bible studies. This is from Eugene Peterson, where he says, the Bible scholars and the Pharisees are veterans in the religious business. They know a person can hide undetected for a long time, maybe even a lifetime, behind religious questions. Have they been doing this their whole lives? Leading Bible studies, asking probing questions, upholding the truths of Scripture, fulfilling religious functions, and have never been found out? And if that's the case, then they don't know God, and they don't experience God's love. And as I read Eugene Peterson on this, it's convicting because... I would debate you guys all along about predestination and whether God's idea for predestination happened in the before he decided to create the world, not even before he created the world, but did he decide to predestine before he decided to create or did he decide to create and then decide to predestine? Those are the sorts of debates you have in seminary and they're a lot of fun. And you sit around and you have all your books and everything and you're like, but who are you showing compassion to? And then I don't have time for that. Do you realize that the Ordo Salutis has to go like this? And if you don't know what the Ordo Salutis is, read a book, but it's also, you're not missing anything. (laughs) This is deep church stuff that only Noah and I know. So so just keep going. You can just hide. You can just hide from God, hide from the lost. 
and you look so busy for God. Have you ever met somebody like this? Or maybe have you been this person? Like, what are you doing for God? Oh, we're having coffee, and then we're going to do this, and then I'm running this errand, and, and I'm, I, all of this stuff. But then you step back and like, Jesus was welcoming sinners and tax collectors. Is that what you're doing? And sometimes it is. We're going to have coffee after church today, and the reason we're doing that is so that we can get to know each other. And if people feel out of community, and right now it's very hard to feel in community when everyone's been wearing masks and being six feet away from each other, we can begin to step in and actually learn to love each other. So sometimes the busy work leads to real stuff, but sometimes it's just busy work for busy work's sake. sake. And maybe one of the good things about COVID is a lot of that busy work has stopped. And we can purposefully think about what can we actually do to show compassion and be Christ's church. Not know you guys well enough to know the busy work you guys were doing. I know in my life, there's a lot of busy work. I mean, how many hours have I gotten back since I couldn't run around and do all the stuff I thought was important? And it's not. Now I can focus on God and family. And so the church of Jesus is called to do what Jesus did to love the lost, to bring them in. When you think about the parable of the prodigal son, you've got a God being described as a dad who would take a son, give him what he doesn't deserve, let him run rampant through the world, and when he comes back, he welcomes him. And this picture here is from um, Rembrandt. And if you look at it real closely, you see the father has two very different styled hands. One is the strong, worn, calloused hand that shows that the God who receives us back is strong and mighty and exercises authority. But the other hand is is thinner. It's more the hand of an artist or a hand that shows compassion, the hand of a surgeon. And it's a God who reaches out with care. Not always the calluses that grab you roughly by the scruff and pull you back in. Sometimes it's the care. And God is saying... (laughs) And Jesus, through the metaphor, is painting with this, and I think Rembrandt captures it beautifully, that God grabs you where we need him to grab us. And he pulls us in and and loves us, and we're called to do that. Jesus did this by taking on flesh. We often miss that, but Jesus, when I use the word embody purposefully, we're called to embody compassion, because Jesus didn't just stay in heaven and say, prophets, tell people I love them. He showed up and took on flesh. The word incarnation, there's a word in carnation it's in a flower carnation's a flower i'm kidding it's carne which which means meat so if you've had chili con carne it's chili with meat so the incarnation is god pretty much with meat on and what the church is called to do is to incarnate to put meat into the mission we don't just have a think tank and a bible study and put stuff on the wall and talk about compassion but we put meat on it We put action to it, muscle and sinew. We get into the world and we love people. That's what we're called to do. And that sort of sets up everything that Jesus is doing. If you read the whole Gospel of Luke, that's been a trend throughout the group, the, um, the, the book, is that Jesus is here to show compassion, to actually be with sinners and tax collectors. That's why in this book we get the story of Zacchaeus. We get the story of the, the lost son, the prodigal son. We get the good Samaritan. It's all about Jesus going to those who don't deserve him and being loved. But some of the odd parables that Jesus says along the way when he's saying this talk about the resources we're supposed to bring to this. And that's our second point, is that our resources are given to us for that mission. The word ministry technically means to take your gifts and resources and use them to meet people's needs. So the old church truism is your time, your treasures, and your talents. You begin to use those to reflect God's will. And don't worry, this isn't going to be where we start passing the plate. I don't think we're allowed to do that yet, although we do have online giving, so you can just get your phone out. But but I think the point is that we're given things. And I mentioned before, I was going to tell you about the parable of the shrewd manager. Here's a little bit of how it goes. This guy's about to get fired, and he kind of gets his two-week notice. I don't know if they did that back then, but Jesus is telling the story. He says, imagine this guy, he's told, okay, I'm going to be letting you go real soon. So figure it out. And he looks at the guy's ledger, and this guy owns 10 oil, barrels of oil. So he goes to the guy, he's like, listen, you owe 10. I'm going to mark this down to five. Just remember me. And the guy's like, cool, I'll take it. Another guy owes like three bushels of grain. He goes, I'll take it down to one. Just remember me. And at the end of the story, um, 
the master finds out about all this, and he commends him. He goes, hey, you're pretty smart. I was going to fire you, now you made a bunch of friends. And this is Jesus' um, take on it. He says, I tell you, use your worldly wealth to gain friends for yourselves, so that when it is gone, you will be welcomed with eternal, dr- eternal dwellings. So Jesus is not, for the record, endorsing embezzlement. Okay, this is, this is not Arthur Anderson and Enron. That's not what Jesus is saying. What he's saying is, use that metaphor. You've been given money for a little while. And the parable of the shrewd manager, he was using the money that was, he was the steward of, he was kind of in charge of, just like you're not actually owning your money, you're just in charge of it, God owns it. And he's using it in a way so that once he's out of this circus, he'll have friends that will be with him. And if you extend that into eternity, use your money so that when we're done with this life, you have friends that you'll be with in eternity. So it's not friends with God. He's not saying bribe God. What he's saying is use your money so that other people around you will be in heaven with you. So how can you use your money so that other people are shown compassion in the name of Jesus? And when you're in heaven someday, someone walks up to you and goes, hey, remember when you gave me that food? Remember when you helped pay for that Bible translation? Remember when you went to Africa? Remember when? And it was your money, your resources were used so that that person's now in heaven. There's that old cheesy 80s Christian song, Thank You for Giving to the Lord. You guys remember it? The songwriter was a part of the church and the pastor was having his 20-year anniversary. And his goal was just to write a song that would make the pastor cry in public. That was his only goal. So he wrote this song that just had this guy imagine like being in heaven and this parade of people coming up and do you remember me? I was in your Sunday school class. That's when I first heard about Jesus. Thank you for giving to the Lord. Do you remember me? I'm somebody that you helped pay some bills for. And now I'm here in eternity. Thank you for giving to the Lord. It's, just this, it's actually a kind of good song. It's a little misty right now. But <laughs> the point that Jesus is saying is you got money and people need the Lord. You can't bribe them into heaven, but could you use your money in a way so that a church a parachurch organization, a missionary, a Bible translation, something happens that will change their lives and that life change could ripple into eternity. It's not always just the gospel. It's providing housing for people so that they feel safe and they find out, well, who is providing this housing? Look at the mission statement. Oh, these were Christians. Interesting. Or maybe it's producing great music. Whatever it is, how are you using your money to get to the Lord? That's the other parable on the other side of Jesus talking about the kingdom He says there was a rich man who was dressed in purple and fine linen and lived a life of luxury every day. And at his gate was laid a beggar named Lazarus, covered in sores, longing to eat what fell from the rich man's table. And even the dogs came and licked his sores. And that night they both die. And the poor man's in heaven, the rich man's in hell. And he's begging for help. And Jesus is saying, even in the middle of all this, that God welcomes the broken. You don't go to hell because you're rich. You go to hell because if you're rich, you trust your money instead of God. That's why 1 Timothy says the love of money is the root of all evil. Money is not the root of all evil. The fact that we would love money more than we love God is the root of all evil. That we would love money more than we love compassion is the root of all evil. That that sort of thinking, it's almost idolatry of money, that says if I have this money, my money will make me safe. And God is in heaven saying, You're dressed in purple, you're well-fed, but eternity's a long story, and your bank account's not lasting that long. There's a big thing right now where people are investing in Bitcoin, and when they pass away, you just can't use a will and get your Bitcoin back. It's all encrypted. That's all of life. It's encrypted. There's no U-Hauls behind hearses. We use it now for eternity. And so the question is, what are we doing with our money? Again, my goal is not to guilt you and say, hey, start giving The goal is just think it through, especially as we come into summer. This is when I start thinking that during the school year, it's real easy to think that my money should serve a purpose. It's got to pay the bills. It's got to do classes. It's got to do all this stuff. But in the summer, this is my money now. I'm getting me a paddleboard. I'm going on vacation. I'm going to do all this stuff. And it's okay to have fun with your money, to go on vacation, to buy a paddleboard. But if you're only doing that and never using your money for compassion then maybe there's a priority wrong. So I'll stop there on the money thing. You guys can pay me to stop. thank me for stopping there. <laughs> um, Jonathan Edwards did talk a little bit about money. I just want to share a little bit about this. He wrote a book called The Duty of Charity Explained and Defended. 
And he talks about how God blesses those who are generous and how he withholds his blessings. And one of the things I love, um, Edwards was a Calvinist, had a very high view of God. And what he says is, it's easy with God to make up to men what he gives in charity. So it's easy. If you give like $100 million in charity and you're able to, God can easily give that back to you. Many forget that everyone's prosperity or lack of prosperity is on the outward affairs depending on God's providence. There's a thousand little turns of life that God's in control of that make people rich or poor. And God may either add to those outward substance or dis diminish from them. I remember watching Little House on the Prairie and the locusts come and they're wiped out. Their poverty wasn't their fault, but it happened and then they needed charity. And so he goes through in the end of the sermon, I won't go through all of these, but he says, here's a few reasons people in the past have argued why they shouldn't give. And one of them says, I've given in the to the poor in the past. I never found myself the better for it. It's kind of having it completely backwards. I gave and I didn't really feel blessed, so I'm done. And Edward says, perhaps you're looking for fulfillment of the promise too soon. And have actually been sparing and grudging. The promises are not made for every man who gives a thing to the, to the poor to suddenly become rich because of it. If you expect to meet with no trouble in the world because you've given to the poor, you've mistook the matter, Edward says. In other words, you can be very generous and life is still going to be hard at times. But he ends with that section with Galatians 6, but don't grow weary in doing good. For in due season you will reap your reward. The next reason we object to giving to a particular person is that we're not obligated to give them anything for they're needy and they're not yet in extreme need. So they do not, they're not in critical straits right now. And Edward says that violates the whole love your neighbor as yourself. Do you wait until yourself is in critical need and then help yourself? I know kids who do that with showering. They only shower when it's a critical need. But normally we don't wait till we're on the brink of starvation and then give ourselves some food. We're about to die of thirst and then we take a sip. As soon as there are need, we satisfy it when it's ourselves. So Edward says, why not have the same matter when it comes to serving your neighbor? Another one is, we may object against charity because someone, um, because he deserves, not that people should be kind to him. That's Edward's wording. He has a temper, an ungrateful spirit, and treats people poorly. So in other words, I don't like him. I'm not going to help him. And Edward's right, but Christ teaches us to love our enemies. We are commended to love one another as Christ has loved us. And this opens up our duty to love in a new manner and goes into a further degree that loving our neighbors ourselves Christ has loved you and was not willing to deny himself. He suffered himself greatly in order to save us. So also we should be willing to deny ourselves in order to help others. Christ loved us even though we were far below him. Christ loved us though we were not able to repay him. Christ loved us though we were evil and hateful and not deserving any good. Christ loved us though he, we were his enemies and treated him ill. Christ loves us so we should love our neighbors. So now I really will move on from money, but those really help me because sometimes I get all those little excuses in my head. Like, why shouldn't I give? There were some people outside of Target and one guy had a violin and they were playing and they had a little sign that, about their need and drove by and gave him some money and then read on the newspaper a few days later that there's actually a sound system that's playing. They're actually playing their own violin and they don't really have the need that they say they need. I'm like, you know what? I knew it. How dare I be generous? And those little things start adding up. And then you remember, like, yeah, Jesus knew that I was a grifter, that I sometimes, you know, say things I don't always mean and pretend I need things I don't, and he, he still loves me. There's another resource that's just hinted at, and I'm not going to spend as long on this one, but it's a weird verse. I almost skipped it, just to be honest. You know you're in trouble when you're tempted to skip the Bible. So um, that's why I kind of had to share it. But in Luke 16, 18, in the middle of all this, he's talking about how the kingdom of God comes. He had just talked about the parable of the shrewd man. The kingdom of God is advancing. The next thing he says is about Lazarus and the rich man. But in the middle of it, he says in Luke 16, anyone who divorces his wife and marries another woman commits adultery. The man who marries a divorced woman commits adultery. And then he moves on. And I'm reading this thinking, really, Luke? Did Jesus just say that somewhere and you forgot where? So you're like, oh, yeah, I should probably write that one down. I don't think that's how the Bible got put together. I think Jesus said this, or if these were a string of sayings, that the Holy Spirit inspired Luke to write these things in a certain manner. 
And I think the reason he puts that there, and I'm not going to get into all the theology of, um, of marriage and divorce and remarriage because that would be a lot, but I think the reason he puts that there is because he knows that marriage is one of the most important and most difficult places to show compassion and to serve. If you're married, you know that it's one of the hardest and most wonderful relationships you'll ever have. And hopefully I'm not offending Erica by saying that. She has the hard, I have the wonderful. Yesterday she worked in the yard for like three hours while I dusted and vacuumed. We're <laughs> that sort of a family. But she... Um, but what God is saying is if you have the whole world that tells you you're ugly and your wife says you're beautiful, you believe your wife or your husband. But if the whole world says you're attractive and your husband or wife says you're ugly, you're going to feel ugly. There's no place that has that much more power over us. And there's no place where serving is so hard because it's every day. I can show up on Sunday and smile and pick up and if someone leaves some coffee cups in the sink, I can wash them and look at me, I'm serving the Lord. I get home, and the water bottles are everywhere, and there's cups, and it's like, we have that, this kind of L-shaped counter that it's not my junk. I don't know whose junk it is over there. And like, just look at it, and you start side-eyeing. It's really not that huge of a deal, but you know what I mean. Just all that little stuff that comes up in a marriage. And what the Bible teaches us is that marriage is the best place to see how God loves us. And there's an odd thing we do in marriage. The traditional thing in marriage in, Ma in Ephesians 5 is that the husband's the head of the wife. Have you heard this? And this is true, but I'm going to explain a little bit. The husband is the head of the wife. And so there's been a long history of people saying, that means the wife will serve me. And I'm going to sit back and have my lazy boy feet up and turn on the game, and I'm going to wait for the nachos and the pot roast and the love and affection to come to me. And I would love if that was true, but unfortunately, that's not the Bible. Um, the word head, when it says the man is the head of the wife, the word head is used a few times in Ephesians. In Ephesians 1, it says that Christ is the head of the church, for which he died. In Ephesians 4, it talks about Christ being the head of the church and how he serves it. And the whole passage around marriage, and he, where it says Christ is the head of the church, is what's been up there, where it says the, head of the, the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church his body, of which he's the Savior. Now, before you start thinking that that means he's the Lord of the manor, keep reading. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to their husbands and everything. A lot of people love to stop there. Husbands, love your wife as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her about washing with water through the word, to present her to himself as a radiant church, without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless, in the same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own body. He who loves his wife loves himself. And later he says, this is a profound mystery, but I'm not even talking about marriage. I'm talking about Christ in the church. And so the reason I bring this up is, one, I think Jesus had this in there, but also, along with our money, if you're married, your marriage is the biggest place where compassion is going to be shown. And if you're not married, then you know that the way that you serve and the way that you help some of your married friends or the way that there's a longing in you at times or loneliness, that those places are what call us to compassion, sometimes for ourselves, sometimes for others. I mean, in my life, I've gone through the gambit of, of marriage and singlehood and, and there's different sorts of struggles and situations in all of them. But every single one, the only thing that will hold you through it whether it's a difficult singleness or a difficult marriage, is the fact that Christ died for you and made you a servant because he served you. And that grace, that washing, that love is what keeps you going so that you can forgive. I heard an amazing sermon by Tim Keller about the book of Hosea this past week where his, where his points where the relationship of God and the church is like a marriage. Second point, it's like a very bad marriage because we don't treat God well, but that God keeps loving us. And so I bring this up because we are called to die. Husbands are called to die for their wives. And if it was easy, just like, you know, if Taliban attacked our house and I could run outside with a machete and a hail of bullets and die for Erica, that would be easy. But changing diapers, doing dishes, dealing with all the little frustrations, those things can be hard. And I'm not the easiest person to live with. Just ask Erica. 
I have this kind of resting mean face. And sometimes I just get like, I'm not mad at her. I'm just kind of surly. And she's like, what did I do? I'm like, nothing. You just happen to be in a world that I hate. <laughs> and she has to deal with that. And all that little stuff, and, and you know, it starts adding up. And it starts adding up, and you just keep serving. And I think that's why Jesus brought this up, is it's where we show compassion. And your kids are watching, and your neighbors are watching. And they're looking to say, oh, that's what the gospel looks like, is she did that, and he forgave her. He did that, and she still loves him. And when they ask you why, you say, well, you know what? God loved me so much. I can't, I just couldn't stop. So in all of this, our last point is that our attitude has to be that of a servant. And being a servant is so un-American. We feel so entitled to everything. But Jesus says that we're, we're called to be servants. That's why when he washed the disciples' feet, he literally dressed. It was almost like a cosplay. He puts on what a slave would wear. He does what the lowest slave would do. And he does it in preparation before he does the ultimate thing of sacrifice, of being on the cross and dying for us. And that's why he says, and I'll just read it again. Suppose you have a servant who's plowing or looking after the sheep. We say to the servant when he comes home from the field, come on now, down and sit. In other words, imagine you have a servant who's been married in a difficult, struggling marriage, and they've just been going through it, and they just want to be done, and can I have some me time? Or you've been faithful with your money, and you've been giving, and it doesn't feel like there's any fruit of it, and just want to be done. And would the master say, come down, sit, let me take care of you for a while? No. Instead, he says, prepare me my supper, get yourself ready, wait with me while I eat and drink. After that, you may eat and drink. And then we'll even thank the servant, or we'll just say, you just did your job. We're unworthy servants, we've done our duty. And I think the reason Jesus puts that all in there, and say, all this compassion, all the giving I'm calling you to, is hard. Let's just admit it, it's hard at times. There can be a joy in service, and I love serving people. I love serving the Lord. But there's times when it can just be a chore. I'm just being honest. Um, you guys aren't a chore, but I've only been here for less than a year. So, But just anything can be a, become a servant. Taking care of your mom, taking care of your kid, taking care of whatever. Just sometimes it feels like it adds up. And you realize, like a servant, I have, no, have an obligation here. I have really no choice. I've done that occasionally when you think about a thing you're called to serve, then you start playing all the mental games. Like, what if I didn't? I'm called to do this, but what if I just didn't do the thing I'm called to do? What would that look like? You can play that out in your head, and it just turns into selfishness and just uh, inflated self. It's not pretty. I'm obligated. But also, it keeps you humble. You see the mess that you have to clean up. You see the person you have to help clean up. You remember... I'm just a servant. I'm not in charge. And not only am I a servant, Jesus came, it says in Mark 10, to serve and not be served. So if Jesus could come and he wanted to serve, then I can serve. And so when I'm tired, I remember that this is not being motivated by morality and guilt. Jesus is not out there saying, if you don't serve, I don't love you. Sinners, tax collectors, Pharisees, law teachers of the law, just remember if you're not a good shepherd, if you're not a good Samaritan, if you're not taking care of the lost, I'm done with you. That's not the message at all, although that's the message we often get in church. The message he says is show compassion because I'm going to show compassion to you. I'm going to die on a cross. I'm going to carry your sin. I'm going to lift you up despite however you're going to treat me. And motivated by that, we keep taking care of the partner that has Alzheimer's. We keep taking care of a special kid, kid, a kid with special needs. We keep taking care of a neighbor who isn't grateful. We keep doing it, not because we have to, but because we have this love. We have this person who served us, and now we're filled with their spirit. So let me close with two contrasting stories on service. Adrian Rogers, I used to hear him on the radio, told a story about a woman who went to a first aid class, and they were doing testimonies. They all had been practicing first aid. And this one woman stood up, and she said, I want to give my testimony. The other day in front of my house, there was an automobile accident, and there was an old man driving who lost control and went over the curb, and he hit an oak tree head on. It was awful. He was thrown into the street. He had a fractured skull and a compound fracture. I could see blood everywhere. She goes, it was horrible. But then I remembered my first aid training, 
And so I sat down, put my head between my knees, and I didn't faint. <laughs> and Adrian Rogers says that a lot of us want a Christianity like that. We're like, you know, I've learned all this stuff about grace, and the world is awful, and I'm just going to get through it. And I'm not going to get my hands dirty. But there's another story I ran across um, about Colin Smith and Ernest Green. Colin Smith was a sophomore in high school who, like the old man in the made-up story, was in a car accident. And unfortunately, he was turned into a quadriplegic. So Ernest Green was 50 years older than Colin. He'd never met face-to-face, but they went to the same church. And so he just went over to him someday and said, you know what, if you need anything while you're in high school, I'll take care of you. So he shaved him, he took him to class, he picked him up from school, helped him get his homework done. And when, college began, when Colin began college, Ernest went with him. When they asked him why, he says, well, I figured it would cost you about 50 grand a year to have full-time help. When I was your age, there was no way I could afford that. It wasn't in the cards for me. I figured it wasn't in the cards for you and your family. But I was retired and widowed, so I had the time. And so he moved to college. And in the interview I heard, they asked him, did you ever think, what have I gotten myself into? He goes, a few times. My day started at 4.30 in the morning. Sometimes it was 14 to 60 hours, 16 hours a day. And at that point, I'd be very tired. I'd want to go home, and young Colin would want to go and do something else. And at Colin's graduation ceremony, the college president turned to Ernest and awarded him an honorary degree. He says, I've never been more shocked in my life. And this is what gets me. He says, I didn't think I had done anything more than any other person would have done. And Colin says, the young guy in the wheelchair, we started together and we finished together. It was only fitting because you were my hands and feet when I couldn't use mine. It's much more than just being a friend. You're like a father to me, like a grandfather, and now we're family. With everything I've said, just remember that you have a savior who served you that way. When you had no righteousness, he became your righteousness. When you had no hands, he became your hands. When you have no feet, he's willing to be your feet. And with that love in us, we can go and do that for other people. We can be their hands when they have none. We can be their feet. Not because we have to, because we get to. We have to show them who Jesus really is. Let me close this in prayer. Heavenly Father, I thank you for for people like Ernest and Colin who show us what the gospel looks like. I'm even more grateful for Jesus who, who really embodied this, who showed us what it's like for a lost son to come home, for a rich man to find salvation for everything, Lord. And so, Father, I pray that your spirit would move us, Lord. That We don't just put our heads between our knees and hope the violent world goes away but we would step out and be your body and show your love. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, as we close, the worship team will come up and our closing song is Servant King, remembering that Jesus really is our servant.